Now we come to chapter 2, verse 1. There are seven churches mentioned in chapter 2 and verse uh, chapter 3. And at the end of the message to each of the churches, we find this phrase, chapter 2, verse 7. For example, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to what? We can say to all the churches. In other words, even though this particular letter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, is addressed to the messenger of the church in Ephesus or to the church in Ephesus, it yet it is a message, according to chapter 2, verse 7, for all the churches. Now, the Apostle Paul, in the New Testament, has written letters to seven churches. To the church of the Romans, the Corinthians, the Galatians, the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians. So there we see, the Apostle Paul, he wrote letters to seven churches. And... They are messages to all the churches in 20 centuries. In the same way, the same Lord who gave a message through the Apostle Paul to seven churches in that first century has also given through the Apostle John a second set of messages to seven churches which are also meant to be messages to all the churches in these 20 centuries. And that's why the number seven is a number of perfection. It applies to the whole world. <clears throat> now, in these letters to the churches, we find Jesus Christ fulfilling his function, which we read in chapter 1, verse 5. You know, the first thing mentioned about Jesus Christ in the description of Christ in chapter 1, verse 5 is what? He is the faithful witness. Or in other words, like a modern phrase, he tells it like it is. He tells us exactly what he thinks of us. Without touching up the photograph in any way. Telling us exactly because he's got eyes like a flame of fire that sees through and through. He loves fervently, but he tells us exactly what we are like. Where there is cause for appreciation, he appreciates. Where there is cause for rebuke, he rebukes. He is the faithful witness. And it's very important for us to see Jesus Christ like this, as one who sees us through and through. Generally speaking, most Christians like to think of Jesus Christ as, as one who is more like a grandfather. See, a grandfather is not usually a faithful witness to his grandchildren. Because he only gives them gifts and does good things and says nice things to them. He doesn't rebuke them or spank them or any such thing. But Jesus Christ is not like that. He's a faithful witness telling us the truth. And he does it in love. And so we find to all the churches, he who has eyes like a flame of fire sees through and through and tells the truth. And each church is addressed in a special way. We read here in verse 1, to the messenger of the church in Ephesus, the message was, first of all, directed to the messenger. That was to the leader of the church there in Ephesus, and through him to the whole church. And what was it? The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The one who holds the messengers of God in his right hand, and who walks among the seven churches. Why does he walk among the seven churches? Because he's always examining. And we said those seven churches represent every local church across the face of the earth, in all these 20 centuries, we can say Jesus is always moving around, examining. We can be sure that Jesus Christ is moving around this church and other churches that call themselves by his name, examining everything to see if it measures up to his high calling. And what does he say? He says this, verse 2, I know your deeds. He certainly does. We can't hide anything from him. And he's saying this in appreciation. The first thing is appreciation. So one mark of God's love for us is that he always appreciates us before he criticizes us. Now men are not always like that. You may suddenly hear from a criticism from a man who's never bothered to appreciate any good thing in you. And that's a sad thing that shows that we haven't understood much about divine nature when we are quicker to criticize something in someone and are not quick to appreciate. 
That's something we can learn from the Lord's message to these seven churches, that even where he has something to criticize, he always finds something good to say where there is something good to say. And that's a wonderful lesson for us to learn. If we want the life of Jesus in us and to partake of the divine nature, let's learn even where somebody is wrong to appreciate what is good. Yes, to appreciate what is good. And so he begins with appreciation. And that's something we can bear in mind in another way also that it's good to have a certain rule to live by in our life that we should never criticize anyone whom we have never appreciated at any time. Because appreciation forms the proper background on which we can write the blackboard, on which we can write the words of criticism. And they are more likely to be accepted. Verse 2. I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance. You cannot endure evil men. You see their good qualities. They were slogging away for the Lord. They were persevering. They didn't give up. They were very careful not to allow evil men to get into their midst. That means people who were corrupt and who brought worldliness and sin into their church. They could not endure them. They disciplined them. They kept the church pure in life. And not only that, they kept the church pure in doctrine as well, we see here. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. Now that teaches us that there are more than twelve apostles. Now many people think there are only twelve apostles, the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Those were the twelve Jesus chose when he was on earth. But by the time John wrote this letter, the other eleven had died. <clears throat> John was the only one alive. So, what is the need to test a person whether he's an apostle if there were no other apostles? There are other apostles. Jesus Christ appoints apostles, and even in the 20th century, throughout the years, Jesus has given to some the ministry of an apostle, like he gives the ministry of prophet, shepherd, teacher, and evangelist as well, according to Ephesians 4, verse 11. So, it's this church didn't, but you know, there's something we can learn here also for the days in which we live. There are some people, many people, who call themselves apostles who are not apostles. So we shouldn't swallow every fellow who comes along and claims to be an apostle. Most of them, most, many whom I've met are false apostles who claim to be apostles. So this church um, tested these people who call themselves to be apostles, and they were very forthright. They told the man to his face, sorry, we believe you're a false apostle. There was no diplomacy in speaking nice things. They were straightforward and upright when it came to false doctrine, when it came to evil men. And verse 3, you have perseverance. That's repeated twice. Here's a church that really slogged away. And you have endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. What a wonderful church. A church which was toiling, persevering, keeping away evil men, keeping away false apostles, purity in life, purity in doctrine. Perseverance again, enduring for the name of Jesus Christ and not growing weary. You would think this church has got everything. There are people who feel that if you've got purity in life, purity in doctrine, we've got everything. But the Lord says to this church and to the messenger who was the leader of this church, but I have this against you. And it's a pretty serious charge. It's a very serious charge. You have left your first love. What that means is, you don't love me fervently as you did in the beginning. Secondly, it also means you don't love one another as fervently as you did at the beginning. That's the charge. Oh yes, you're keeping your thought life pure. You're not gossiping. You're not backbiting. You're keeping your speech pure. You're righteous in money matters. You're paying your income tax properly. You're not allowing evil men to come into the midst. You're keeping your doctrine pure. But that fervency of devotion that you had for me once upon a time. Remember the days when you were converted first. What devotion you had to Jesus. It's all dried up now. Now you're going through a routine of going to meetings and reading the Bible and activity. All good. But that fervency of devotion to Jesus has gone. It has dried up. 
It's like a wife who's lost her love for her husband. Because that's the picture uh, used. The bride and the bridegroom, church and Christ. It's like a, uh, a wife who uh, did everything in the house out of fervent love for her husband. Used to uh, cook the food and wash the clothes and look forward to her husband coming back from office and really love him. Five, ten years later, she still cooks the, clo- uh, cooks the food and washes the clothes and everything, but it's, uh, he's not, it's just a routine. She's not eagerly looking forward to her husband anymore. All the activity is there. And the Lord says, what do you think I have been united to you for? Is it just to cook my food and wash my clothes? I want your devotion. I want your devotion first. You have left your first love, and also your fervent love for one another, which you once had. Once it was your boast that you loved one another fervently, and you stood out among the churches. The church that fervently loved one another in the midst of so many other churches, where they didn't love one another. But now, that love has grown cold. It is. You've left. It. You haven't given up your doctrine. You haven't given up your personal purity of life, but you've given up your first love. Is this a serious thing? Yes, it is. In fact, it is so serious, verse 5, that he says, you've got to remember from where you have fallen. You have fallen. Can you imagine this is a fall? We think a man's fallen only when he's committed adultery or start going to the cinemas or gambling or drinking or something like that. No. He's fallen. Blessed are we if our conscience is so sensitive that we recognize that when we lose that fervency of devotion to Jesus Christ and that fervency of love for one another, we have fallen. We certainly have. He who has a year, verse 7, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to all churches in all 20 centuries, that when you lose your love, you've virtually lost everything. It's so serious that it's, you've got to repent. The middle of verse 5. Repent that verse which we preach to the unbeliever in the gospel meeting. You repent. Jesus says to the people in the church, he says, you repent first before you tell all the other people around you to repent. Repent of that lack of love you had for one another. That lack of love for me and for your fellow believers. And do the deeds you did at first. That means... Your works must once again spring out of love. In other words, the motive with which you are doing all these deeds and perseverance and toil is more important than the deeds themselves. And we shall discover in the final day, when we stand before the Lord, that the motive with which we served him was much more important than our service itself. And what is going to be the punishment if the church and the leader of the church does not repent? Here it is. Else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. The lampstand is the church. The Lord says I will remove. This lampstand out of its place means uh, you, as far as I am concerned from heaven, the Lord says, you will no longer be a church. But of course, you will have a board outside saying uh, the first church in Ephesus or something like that. And people will still come to your meetings. But as far as God is concerned, he says, I have no longer, I'll no longer consider you to be a church in my eyes. I'll remove the lampstand. For what sin? For what sin? For their loss of love. Blessed is the church who realizes the seriousness of it. Brothers and sisters... When a local church, keeping purity in doctrine and all the other wonderful standards against sin and all that, loses its fervency of love for Jesus and loses the fervency of its love for one another, it is in great danger, as far as God is concerned, of ceasing to be a church in his eyes. That's something very important for us to bear in mind. Verse 6, but he says, you've got some good qualities. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. Now, there is no other verse in the scripture which tells us what the Nicolaitans were, or who they were, or what their doctrine was, or what their deeds were. 
So in the absence of any particular uh, verse that teaches us what exactly they did and taught, we have to try and understand it from the meaning of the word Nicolaitan. Now, this is a Greek word. The New Testament was first written in Greek. And the word Nicolaitan is a, a combination of two Greek words. That word L-A-I-T is the word from which we get the English word laity. Laity means the ordinary people. Nikio means to conquer, and it means to conquer the people, the common people. So we see that here in this church, towards the end of the first century, was the beginning of a certain evil seed. An evil seed of certain people in the church who wanted to dominate the others. Uh, a sort of special priestly class who were going to be priests in a special way in which the other believers were not going to be priests. And there, around 100 AD, we see the origin of this wretched system that has led to a distinction between certain people as priests and certain people as not priests, certain people as pastors, and certain people as not pastors, certain people as reverends, and certain people as not reverends. It began there. But the Lord says, you hate the deeds of those people, and I also hate them. That type of desire to dominate others is something which God hates, because it is like making a special mediatorial class of people a special class of people who are mediators between Jesus Christ and the common people. It is as though Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 2, 5, who is the one mediator between God and men, is not enough. We want to add a second mediator in between. Now we know that the Roman Catholic Church has got this teaching, which is completely false, of Mary being a second mediator between Jesus Christ and us. But I tell you, a lot of Protestant churches... And Pentecostal churches have an equally false teaching when they have a pastor who has to find God's will for you. What is he? He's a sort of a second mediator too. Sure. That is this Nicolaitan class of people who want to be a little above and don't, uh, the others and don't allow the other people to come directly to Jesus Christ ahead. In a local church, Jesus Christ wants everyone to have a direct connection with him. God has given different gifts in the church to teach, to evangelize, to uh, be prophets and all that, but none of them must come between the individual believer and Christ. That's the thing which Jesus hates. When a man tries to come between another soul and Jesus Christ in any way, in dominating him in some way or uh, making him dependent on my prophecies or any such thing, Jesus hates it. Let's never forget that. And that desire to dominate others, sometimes it can be through money. There are many Western organizations, Christian organizations, that control people in India with money. God is not enough. Jesus is not enough. You also need my money. You're dependent on me. You jolly well listen to what I say if you want to survive. Jesus hates that. We're never to dominate others with our gift or with money or any other way. Because Jesus has called every one of us to be servants. And is there somebody who is very great in the church? Then he must be the servant of all, Jesus said. So Jesus hates those who are Nicolaitans. And he says, as far as you're concerned, you hate them. In the church in Ephesus, they were not there. They were driven out. He says, he doesn't say they were there in your midst, but they were there in some of the other churches. And he says, you have kept them out, and I'm very uh, proud of you for that. Verse 7. He who has a year, let him hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. Now, all the things we have just considered is what the Holy Spirit is saying to all the churches in every century. But he also recognizes one very important thing. That out of all the people who are sitting in each church, they will not all have a year to hear. It's not that they are deficient in hearing and are deaf, no, but that they don't have a spirit that's willing to do what God wants them to do. They want to have their own way. That's what it means. But 
The one who has a year to hear, the overcomers, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. And so we see here that in the church there is a group of people who are called the overcomers. These are people who have conquered these things that we see are where the church comes short of God's standard. For example, in the midst of the church in Ephesus, the overcomers would be those who keep their love burning in the midst of all the other people who have lost their love. In a local church where we find people are going down from God's standards, there must be a group of people who stand for God's standards, who keep their love burning. Those are the overcomers who overcome sin, who overcome this losing of the first love and keep it burning. And so we see that right through the seven churches, Jesus Christ is dealing primarily with the overcomers. 